Welcome to Between the Vines. My name is Kevin Martin. I'm here with Jennifer Phillips Russo, and we are the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program Extension Extension Team. Uh, this two-state program, Penn State Cornell, uh, is right now a team of two, but we hope to expand it back to its original team of four in the very near future. Uh, so right now we are we are the the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program, uh, and hopefully we'll have some some new talent in the future uh, on this podcast. Uh, we did have a coffee pot meeting and some crop updates that went out this week, and I think that's a good part of what we want to discuss and sort of what is going on currently in the Lake Erie region in terms of things like phenology and grower practices that need to occur. Uh, that's always a big topic in early June. Well, it's a very busy time of year for us, uh, for our growers. And so um, monitoring things like phenology uh, lead to the reaction of, of a lot of different practices. So, so that's what is occurring right now. Uh, Jen, did you want to start sort of, I, I guess, with where we're at or? Uh, Absolutely. All right. So, you know, the weather has obviously been getting better. It's sort of on a cool down now. But with that, it has really pushed the vines. You can go somewhere and they are almost full canopies, not to the ground, but certainly stretched out. So that expects us to uh, look at some of the clusters and start watching for trace bloom, at least on the concords is what we usually report on. And I can tell you that I've been in vineyards all week and I have not seen, and I've been looking very closely, I have not seen any trace bloom in the concords yet. That's not to say that you guys don't have some, maybe down on a sucker or something closer to the ground, but up in the canopy, I have not found any trace bloom yet. However, there have been a lot of bio indicators going on. I'm a little bit stuffy this morning because as soon as it looks like snow in June in Western New York and all of those cottonwoods and everything else is out blooming, it's very hard for me to, ble to breathe it's like that. <clears throat> but then you just kind of look around and know that you're supposed to start watching things. So people are watching wild grapevines this is a great thing to watch to, so you can start your grape berry moth model in NUA. And I have to tell you, I was in Ripley, New York on Wednesday this week and the grapevine right next to a vineyard that I was looking at, wild grapevine, full bloom, full bloom. <laughs> some even had some berries set on it. So I would anticipate that that probably happened when you could call that wild grapevine bloom about Sunday, Sunday or Monday of this, this week. I don't even know what day with that. That was the 31st, May 31st would be. Right. Monday. So either May 30th or May 31st on the wild grape bloom. Okay. Again, you need to put that in a new way. You need to track that, put it in your viticulture planning calendar so that you can start tracking the growing degree days for the great berry moth generations. And um, I, I'm pretty sure we sort of discussed what we're going to talk about before. So I know it's the 810 growing degree days. Are you going to touch base on that? Or we're just going to basically talk about immediate pre-bloom and immediate post because that's coming up. Yeah, I wasn't going to. I mean, I would say this did come up in the coffee pot meeting. So what does that mean relative to average? And it doesn't necessarily mean anything yet because we could have some lousy, lousy weather or even just kind of not ideal weather. And things in terms of growing degree day accumulation could slow down quite a bit, but but it does certainly increase the likelihood of an extra generation of berry moth. We're early early enough so that it does increase that likelihood, uh, but we are late enough so that it really would be weather dependent. So so this is occurring a little bit earlier than average, but not enough earlier that you could say that it's that it's almost certain we'd have an extra generation. It's really gonna be weather dependent, probably mostly over the next four weeks. So once we get to 850, um, you know, July in terms of growing degree days is usually pretty consistent. You, you probably have a good idea by the time we target berry moth at 850 growing degree days, when we're gonna reach the, the 1600, so. Right. So. I haven't found trace bloom in Concord grapes yet. However, I have growers sending me pictures of trace bloom in Niagara's. It's not all over the place, but they are definitely, this was as of yesterday. So yesterday was June 2nd. People were sending me photos of their Niagara trace bloom around the belt. 
And it was a few here or there. It's, I mean, it's trace. It's not, we, we call bloom when 50% of the flower clusters are on 50% of the clusters in the canopy. So these are, you know, a flower here and there. <laughs> but it is coming. And if the weather continues to be nice, it'll be faster than we know it. We get one of those degrees days where it's 80 and sunny all day. It goes really fast. So Terry does his prediction, Dr. Terry Bates at the Cornell Lake Erie Research and Extension Laboratory in Portland, New York. We've talked about it before, but if you're just listening, we are right on the borders of Lake Erie and he tracks the lake degree days or the temperature of the lakes and gives a prediction every year. And originally his prediction that he gave on, I believe it was May 2nd, said that it was going to be June 12th of this year. And then things started heating up and staying hot for a while there. So things started pushing. So we went back and took another look and he adjusted his prediction to between June 9th and 10th, somewhere around in that area. Now, again, it's a prediction. No one has a crystal ball, but it is based on science and it has been pretty close throughout the years. So just to give you an idea that you should start terminating, if you haven't already, those middle rows. You wanna reduce the competition with the vine during its stages of rapid shoot growth. So that's two weeks before bloom and up to four weeks after. We don't want any competition for water and nutrients at that time. So you should get out there and start taking care of them. If you haven't, I do see some are turning as I'm driving through the belt. So good on ya. You will also want to get those sprays on. And I know that what Kevin really wants to focus on, Brian Head from the Northeast Lab, PSU, or Penn State University, gave a really good talk at our coffee pot about that. Yeah, and I get the impression, maybe I'm wrong, but I get the impression that um, the growers that do timely weed sprays have completed them. Uh, there is a culture and tradition of some growers doing short mowing and trying to make the best of that situation, okay. which typically lowers yield and vine size and reduces profitability. But if that is your strategy, you know, I don't think we're going to convince you in this podcast to try something different because it's, you know, row middles have been bare from, from pre-bloom to, you know, the, towards the end of July for, for decades for most growers. And, and I think most of those growers have, have, have done that. But like you said, there, there was a few days of cool weather. And I think we did drive around and see quite a bit of green because I think they did postpone that because of the cost of Roundup and there was a lot of soil moisture. So maybe some risks were taken a little bit to push that back a little bit and it just wasn't showing up as burned. That's my theory based on just the number of growers I talked to that have just said, yeah, my weed spray is done. I've done that. Um, fertilizer does seem to be a little bit behind, which is not a bad thing um, because- I agree, I've heard that too. Because I think growers really try to work around the weather when it comes to fertilizer applications. So true. that pushed them back this year a little bit because it's difficult to put those on in the rain. And there's also, you know, a desire to put them on right before a rain. So it's been tricky to, to make those applications. So I think those are going on now, um, which is going to make the pre-bloom disease management um, sort of a condensed or truncated amount of time for a lot of growers in which they have to get that immediate pre-bloom on. Because if, if Terry's predicting the ninth and trace bloom occurs four or five or six days before that, trace bloom should be today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think when some of our vineyards, we know that there's not trace bloom today. So maybe the ninth is just a hair early or trace or it's going to develop rapidly and there's going to be trace bloom um, very close occurring very close to when 50 percent bloom actually occurs either one of those things i think could be true but either way it means you've got less than a week to put on your immediate pre-bloom spray and your media sure. and your posts are the most important ones for disease yeah. and we know that pre we've got less than seven days to do it so yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. So if we're ready to talk about that, that's one of the things I wanted to touch on. It's the most important. And for the most part in Concord, it should be the most expensive, especially the, the first post bloom spray. 
Uh, the only thing about the pre-bloom spray is we know that we need to keep those intervals close. In Concord, we have enough resistance, like sort of natural resistance to diseases that we don't typically use a material um, that, is, that is absorbed by the plant or lasts very long for this immediate pre-bloom to cover most of our major diseases. We don't have to think about it too much. We use EBDCs, they wash off, but they're inexpensive and very effective. Uh, particularly this time of year, we need to use EBDCs because they're effective against Phomopsis and we still need protection against Phomopsis. And this is the last time we can use them because of um, market and processor regulations on the use of EBDCs post bloom. So in the wine grape industry, they might be able to use a material like that, but, but in the juice grape industry, we'd be done. So, so we don't have to think too much about it. We just have to make sure we put it in the tank and we do it in a timely way. We, we just, we use EBDCs, it covers everything except for powdery mildew. Um, powdery mildew, I think a lot of growers that I have talked to have already purchased their materials and they didn't just purchase one material. Uh, they looked at the supply chain, they looked at the costs of powdery mildew materials and saw that they didn't look anything like Roundup. So they were going to make those investments in December, January, February, and they took delivery probably six weeks to three months ago, depending on the grower. So I don't, I have been cautious of telling, you know, telling a grower this year that, you know, maybe you want to, to consider a different material because I think they already purchased that material. So the way I sort of discussed it in the crop update is take a look at your inventory and for powdery mildew, uh, use your second best material this week for your immediate pre-bloom and use your best material uh, for the post-bloom, the immediate post-bloom 10 days later. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you take a look at your inventory and you don't see Luna Experience, Gatton, Endura, Vivando, Quintec, or Torino, or you only see one of those, then your second best material is not good enough and you need to go get some material. So those six sprays, Luna Experience, Gatton, Endura, Vivando, Quintec, Torino, and I don't think I forgot any, but certainly all six of those are very good materials and you need two very good materials. Uh, we could talk about how when grapes are $100 a ton, um, maybe you only need one good material. When there's absolutely no rainfall or disease pressure, maybe you only need one material and you're hand pruning everything and it's umbrella, maybe you only need one material. None of those things exist. So this year, grape prices are high. Um, pruning work was marginal if or average or, you know, it certainly wasn't the best pruning job you've ever had done, but it was marginal to average and disease pressure is relatively high as well. So you need two of those. And if two of those are in your inventory, pick the best one for the post bloom spray and use the second best one for um, the immediate pre. And a lot of those perform close enough. So it's a little difficult to say like, Gatton versus Luna experience, which one is better? And it will vary, I think, a little bit from farm to farm, depending on how much each farm has used one of those in terms of not just like resistance management, but also trying to manage them to make sure that they continue to be the best material. So in all likelihood, it's going to be Luna, Gatton, or Endura because those have been used the least. Any three of those have a tendency to be the best material. Bavando, Quintec, Torino are in the group of materials that um, are probably more likely to be the second best material. If you have Gatton and, and Endura, or, or mm -hmm. you know, then it's probably close to a coin flip for some growers. You know, they're so close that I, you could almost flip a coin. Or if you have Vivando and Quintec, you might be able to flip a coin. But again, it would depend on the individual farm and the usage. Um, the other material that growers can use is Sevia. I'm not exactly sure how that works in to the program that a grower should use. So Sevia is an interesting material in that it covers black rot and might have a little bit of action against Phomopsis and is going to be a little bit more expensive than almost all of these very good materials that I've talked about. It will be cheaper than Luna Experience, but it does cover black rot. So 
you know, where does it work in if it's not quite as good on powdery as these materials, but it covers black rot? I mean, it's probably like it, it doesn't fit super well in in the pre-bloom spray because you already have a material for black rot in um, in, in your EBDC. Uh, it doesn't work awesome in your immediate post because all these other materials might be a little bit stronger on powdery mildew. Um, if for some growers that I talk to, I think it is maybe an interesting material for the pre-bloom spray this year because they reported some pretty significant black rot issues last year for the first time in a very long time. So you could use it to clean up some inoculum and it would only cost you a couple extra dollars an acre. And it would definitely be a good enough material for your, your uh, pre-bloom powdery. And then you could follow up with something like a Gatton or an Indura. And cleaning up that inoculum might be a really good idea this year because right. of the pruning jobs. That right. Yeah. So the advantage here is it's going to be a systemic material. Mm -hmm. So if you need something systemic for black rot, we don't typically put that in the immediate pre-bloom. So it'll give you that. And sometimes we don't put anything systemic in in the immediate post-bloom. You know, once you get to post-bloom, trying to cover all these major diseases, then it does become a thought process. And we haven't gotten to that. And I didn't cover it in the crop update. Mm -hmm. But there's a thought process there because Xyrem is the only thing that's left that covers all of your major diseases. So typically it does make sense to use Xyrem, but then you need to make realize that you, um, you are not using a systemic material and disease pressure against berries can be pretty high for a little while there. So you definitely want to avoid stretching intervals past 10 or 12 days with a product like Xyrem. So the one thing we did talk about is you know, we talked about growers who don't have two out of six or seven of those chemicals in their inventory. Um, we didn't talk about growers who have maybe three of those materials in their inventory and do a lot more and have been trying to do sort of the opposite in terms of they have not, their business model doesn't involve low input, low yield viticulture. It involves very high input and hopefully high yield viticulture, because if the yield's not there, then they then they really have an issue because they have high input costs. Um, so in that situation, we are we do regularly see growers who tank mix a material for powdery mildew in the pre and post bloom. And this will increase the cost of that that um By how much? that application. So it will depend a lot on what they use. Um, officially they'll use things like stylet oil, neutral, or tebuconazole. Um, stylet oil and neutral have eradicant properties. So if they missed an infection period, which most growers did, um, I don't know if they missed one that's severe enough that this is crazy important, but maybe they did. Uh, if they missed it, there will be activity um, by both neutral or a stylet or cultural or horticultural oil. So they'll mix that in uh, and, and that will raise the price by it will depend because for something like stylet oil, it's a the rate is a concentration. So it depends on how much water you're, you're using. You're trying to use one, one and a half percent. It tends to be a lower price, something closer to five, six, seven dollars an acre in the pre-bloom because you're using less water. Um, something like neutral is is higher in price. It is more like a foliar feed that is labeled for use on powdery. And it is called neutral because it, because it is neutral from a pH perspective. That's why it has that name. Growers that use foliar feeds, if you check your water pH, you might see that it changes dramatically when you use like a, a foliar feed that has fertilizer in it, whereas neutral will not. So it will be two or three times more expensive than a typical foliar feed um, and will probably, you know, increase the cost by 10 to $15 an acre. Tebuconazole, it doesn't have any any uh, eradicant properties. It does have post-infection activity, as do some of the good powdery mildew materials I listed. Some do, some don't. Um, tebuconazole does. It is just a very old material. It's less active. Um, it's less prone to resistance managed, resistance, but there's definitely a, some good potential for resistance there. It's just not as prone as like something like a bound was. So it has hung on for a long time with some activity. And that's why it gets tank mixed in, even though it's not an eradicant, because it's like two, $3 an acre. And 
it does seem to do a better job than just using, say, I don't know, we'll say Vivando alone. Um, if you are using a stylet oil or any oil, just make sure that it's compatible with your tank mix. The one thing that jumps out to me is you can't always use Vivando and stylet oil together. So, you know, we don't want you to use tank mixes that, that injure your grapes, but the um, labels the law. <laughs> yeah. And there's a reason, I mean, we've definitely, there's definitely been damage to flower. I think it's flower clusters, uh, with Vivando or at least concern about damage. So, you know, from the perspective of materials, the cost of the next two sprays, uh, just for materials, should be 75 to 85, maybe $90 an acre. And combined. Yeah, combined. If you're yeah. getting to 90, it's probably because you either have an inoculum issue and you're tank mixing both in the pre and the post, and or you have a particular insect that you're targeting on at least some of your of your acreage. So most growers don't throw in an insecticide at this time um, without scouting. But if you're scouting, you might find a number of different insects that need to be sprayed. You know, like leafhopper, this would be the time that leafhopper could potentially cause ec economic damage. But in most of our vineyards, we don't see it rise to a level where it does. Although we have had some growers say that they've already sprayed for it because they see. But, you know, please scout and make sure that that the population is adequate enough to justify right. that spray. And I'm not saying that it was or it wasn't, but I do know that that um, we just because you see leafhopper. So leafhopper mm, is damaging leaves. We're allowed to have damaged leaves. We just can't have too many. So so whenever something is damaging a leaf and not the berry, we need to scout for it. That's all. So also, this is a good part, point in the conversation to promote the guidelines. So Penn State and Cornell put out the great pesticide guidelines. And if you're a member, you can get them through, or if you're not a member, you can order them through our website. Yeah, if you're watching the video, you can, I can Vanna White it. They're just sitting behind me, so. <laughs> they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's a really great resource that's put together by a lot of the researchers and extension agents, so. Yeah, so I will say, you know, we're talking about these two really important sprays that might be $40 or more in terms of material. Um, these, these are still not technically probably your most expensive spray applications. The most expensive ones are going to be in that post bloom period, um, particularly if you start to need an eradicant for maybe, we'll say downy mildew or something like that. And then you'll see the costs rise. Uh, but a lot of, in Concord anyway, a lot of that cost can be avoided if, um, in an average crop year especially, but if you are, are keeping your intervals close and spraying these types of materials now, and that's sort of the goal. Um, sometimes growers eliminate sprays altogether, but certainly there's usually not a justification for, um, for, really robust programs and expensive programs in the post bloom period after that, especially first or second post bloom spray, if your intervals are close now. So we do start to lose a lot of options. We don't have EBDCs that th makes things more expensive. We start to rely on things like SIs and um, that can make things more expensive because we're tank mixing, because we're worried about effectiveness. And, um, you know, a lot of things used to cover a lot of diseases. They no longer do. I mean, I think growers might start to spray a bound um, and mix that in with something so that they are covering at least powdery, if not downy. And really the abound is only there. I'm sorry, at least powdery if not downy as well. So really the abound is only there for maybe a little bit of Phomopsis and black rot. Um, so this is gonna, you know, to try to get the, that systemic spray, those systemic sprays on in the post bloom period, uh, eradicants are few and hard to come by and the materials we do have are more expensive than EBDC. So all of a sudden, instead of just spending a lot of money to protect against powdery, you're spending money to protect against downy or eradicate um, tr attempting to eradicate powdery or downy. 
So that's why we focus on these two sprays. That's why we make sure we spend 75 to 85 or $90 an acre on them combined um, to try to save money or if it's a high disease, high pressure year, save crop down the road. So that's, that's the goal. That's why we recommend what we do. And, um, you know, I think that's about it. I think it's a relatively simple process to make these decisions in the, the first pre-bloom and it's a little more complicated in the second pre, in the, in the first post-bloom, it's a little more complicated. Well, and um, just looking at the weather forecast going forward, we're saying that it's, it is cooling down a little bit, but that's just cooling down to 50s. It's above 50 each time, like each in the forecast, looking at the <clears throat> lows and it gets up into the 80s. But there's also rain on Monday and Tuesday in our region, or at least a 60 percent chance. And also watch your wind speeds that are predicted, too, so you know when you can get out there and spray. I saw someone spraying when the winds were really high the other day. It is. I mean, I would say that. Well, we could call it a three inch spray or a 10 inch spray, or it started out as a two inch spray. And by the time you finished, it was a 12 inch spray, whatever it was. Um, I think it was very, it's, it was rare where growers already have two EBDCs on. So I think tank mixing might be a consideration. Um, and it was difficult to put it on. I mean, there were most growers did not get full days to put applications right. on. They were interrupted by either wind or rain. So it took longer. And then they took days off because it, we had full days of rain. So there's definitely some disease pressure out there this year. I agree. I don't want to get off topic. I think that um, you wrote a really good crop update. Thank you for that. And those of you who are members, that should be in your email box or inbox from yesterday. <clears throat> Excuse me. I do want to touch base because you just mentioned tank mixing next week, next Wednesday. So the Lake Erie Regional Grape Program has our coffee pot meetings throughout the growing season on every Wednesday at different locations in our entire region. They're, it, the in-person ones are from 10 to 12. You can find a list of them on our website, lergp.cce.cornell.edu or lergp.com. It's out there, but we also have Zoom meetings in the evening time on every second Wednesday of the month. June 8th is the second Wednesday this month. We've had people from PA asking about core credits. Some people really need that core to continue with their pesticide applicator license. And if you have New York, you should also have some of your credits should be in the core category, about 25%. We are offering our Zoom meeting June 8th. You need to pre-register online at lergp.cce.cornell.edu. Give us your pesticide information through that registration process. And it's worth two credits, one in category and one in core for New York. So Kevin, is that two PA and four PA? Do you remember? Yes. Okay, because it's usually double of what New York is. I so think we only, are. I I think the evening one is only one. Um, for New York, the evening one is two, so oh, it's one okay. for category okay. and one for core credit because we're having okay. Mary Centrella, who's the director of Cornell's Pesticide Safety Equipment program. Okay. I think it's equipment. I apologize for not pronouncing the acronym correctly if I if I did. But she is going to be giving a talk on tank mixing and compatibility and it's a cool Yeah, I know we did get the two core credits. Okay. So if you're looking for those credits and I know a lot of you are, this is a 2 hour leave your camera on, listen to us talk about up to date and timely viticulture business and IPM strategies and then an hour of tank mixing compatibility in core. So join us on June 8th for that. Also, we had our in-person informal walkthrough yesterday. A lot of our coffee pot meetings, we've had a discussion about labor and how it's really hard to come by. And we already touched base earlier in this podcast about pruning. Some of it is um, not the best it could have been this year due to lack of labor being involved. So we had people come over, growers, industry representatives and walk through for the last four years, Dr. Terry Bates and his crew have had a differential mechanization pruning trial going on. And they talked about how, what the pruner looks like and how it works, at least the one that we have. And Andy Joy did discuss other pruners that are out there. 
And then we went down and showed them what the canopy looks like, how the differential pruning did. And they all, over the last four years, no matter how they pruned them, ended up with the same amount of yield averaging out between all the treatments. So we're going to be putting together a podcast on that for anybody, not for, of the walkout yesterday, but we will be putting a podcast together on that for you to see. So look forward to that coming up. Excellent. Yeah, we'll probably be talking more in the future about H2A workers, uh, what needs to be done to, um, to do that, and sort of the complexities of the program, which are one of the biggest barriers. Uh, and we need to do that somewhat soon. So if you look, typically an H2A worker is can become available 75 days after, um, after the, the filing has been completed with um, completed with the the uh, department of the national processing center or the state and so so 75 days after that the problem is a, a lot of times it's difficult for growers to fill out these applications and that that can take quite a while and especially if there's an error in that application process so typically speaking to get workers in um, you're looking at a six month lead time uh, and that allows for some recruitment uh, you know down i think i think the 75 days if you're looking for resources from government sources is sort of more of a theoretical thing because you do have to be able to recruit these workers or someone has to recruit them on your behalf um, and the application has to be filled out correctly. So that's where 75 days turns into uh, 150. But I'm glad we're talking about doing some programming around that. Yep. To kind of hope help walk you through it. So. Yes. Um, so all of that sort of to come in the future. But for now, this is all we have for this week. If there's something else you want to hear, please feel free to reach out and we'd be happy more than happy to to discuss it we're always looking for topics um, even during the growing season so uh, we will see you next week at one of our coffee pot meetings i hope and uh, that's all for now yeah have a great Thanks, week yeah. everyone thank you everybody